next speaker is Judy Cho. Uh, Judy is very important to the cancer center, especially because she controls BioMe. So we have to be very nice to her. But Judy is <coughs> also studies inflammatory bowel disease. It's genetics. And studies a group of patients that I didn't realize we know about. They're called uh, AJs. No, Judy, take it away. Thank you, Steve, I think. Okay, so I'll be talking about precision cancer and biome um, opportunities and some challenges we face in trying to do this uh, large scale. So I spent most of my career doing case control studies focused primarily on inflammatory bowel disease. And two or three years ago when I was asked to lead biome, um, it's, a, it's a different nature of a question. Um, it's not ascertaining by case control status, but rather is randomly ascertaining within a healthcare system. And this provides uh, very interesting new challenges and new sets of questions. And so what are the advantages of a health control-based, randomly ascertained biobank? First off, the designation of case control is overly simplistic. You know, you either have Crohn's disease or you don't. But when you think about the lifelong events that contribute to increased risk of cancer, typically over the age of 50, it's complex. And clearly, the case control status um, is overly simplistic. Secondly, uh, the health systems contain with them so much more information than simply whether you have Crohn's disease or not, cancer or not. Um, and there's a wealth of data that, that, that lives throughout the electronic health record, including radiology, pathology, surgical reports, and text data, but this can be extremely difficult to extract. Um, the third point, which again is very difficult and is a huge advantage of sitting within the Mount Sinai health system, is that disease is time dependent. Um, and it's very hard to mine. Um, and again, over time, we have increased risk of cancer as we age. And how you model that, how you predict it, how you identified it early is a major uh, challenge. And so the goal here, when you think about biobank-based analysis, it's flipping the genetic paradigm. Instead of taking a trait of interest and saying, what are the genes or genotypes that contribute to it? We're flipping this paradigm and saying, we've had 10 years now of GWAS, sequencing, and gene discovery. We know which genes and alleles may be important. And let's deeply within the health system understand what are the phenotypes that co-segregate with this over time through the lifespan. Um, so the anchor of the IPM is the Biome blood-based EHR-linked biobank. It was uh, started in 2007 by Erwin Bottinger. Um, the consent is a key com component of this. Uh, the patient's consent to retrospective and prospective mining of the EHR. Uh, we're able to leverage the massive power of the Mount Sinai Health System, a very large outpatient footprint, which is a major advantage. Um, thus far, we have 42, over 42,000 participants. And a key component of this um, is the diversity. This really is the strategic strength of doing research in New York City, uh, as well as the EHR like Biobank. Uh, this is a pie chart that Emer Kenny uh, made for us, uh, looking at different parts uh, of the Manhattan Island. If you go turquoise for Hispanics, if you go north to south, uh, at gray uh, are the European ancestry. Um, you can see the different neighborhoods within Manhattan that comprise uh, the city we all live in. So one of the principles for how you can make a difference in patients in the short and intermediate term is earlier diagnosis. And one of the ways, uh, the paradigms that you know, Emer's new center on population genomic health, together with Nora uh, Abu Hussein, um, is really taking a genetics first approach, mining all of that information, and being able to personalize therapies and personalize screening therapies earlier. Um, and so uh, this is from the ACMG 2016 recommendations that Nora sent me. Um, and so basically, if you look at table one and that says, okay, if you do clinical exome sequencing and you incidentally find these mutations, they're actionable. We should do something about them. And the top of table one is dominated by autosomal dominant germline highly penetrant cancer-associated mutations. And so this is a very powerful tool. And if you want to find out ways to take Steve's challenge on of how do we make a difference in patients now, uh, this is one mechanism whereby we can do this. Um, I was asked to just look at the prevalent cancers in Biome, and this is a total of them. This is attained age, um, and you can see that we have a large number of prevalent cancers, about a quarter of which are possibly incident. Um, and then another concept that Pamela Sklar actually first introduced to me that I wasn't aware of is this idea of polygenic risk scores, germline variants, if you count all common variation as well as those highly penetrant variations, 
you can actually do a better job of predicting risk for disease. Uh, this is a very complex graph. I just refer you to the paper uh, that basically looks at age on the y-axis. The dashed line refers to the general screening time that you're recommended. But if you actually integrate the polygenic risk score, especially for breast cancer, you can actually do a better, and then red is family history and blue is no family history, you can actually do a better job of personalizing when people are gonna be at increased risk for various cancers. So the summary for cancer genomic strategies is that I would really strongly advocate for a genetics first approach. Uh, there's a lot of regulatory challenges with this. Uh, the poly polygenic risk scores potentially in some cancers can be used to improve population-based screening. Uh, would really make a push for just empirically, let's just try doing clinical exome sequencing in 1,000 patients. Uh, together with Ramon, we're working on targeted recruitment to the high volume clinics, either colonoscopies, mammographies, or CT scans and smokers to get larger numbers. We're gonna need larger volumes than we've collected so far in order to look at liquid DNA. And finally, there's gonna be some integration challenges with tissue-based biobanks, so thank you.